What is going on guys? This is Arctic Fox. Welcome back to the channel. Now today we are covering another cold case spotlight. Today we are shining the spotlight on a young lady named Judith Ann Brown who disappeared from Queens, New York on the 6th of April 1977 when she was only 19 years old. At the time of her disappearance, she was 5 foot 4 inches tall and weighed 125 pounds with sandy light brown hair and green eyes. She did have an extra tooth behind others on her front and lower uh, jaw. Uh, Judy was known to take extreme care of her appearance and kept her nails very well manicured. Uh, she did wear an engagement ring at the time of her disappearance. She disappeared with Richard Reisenberg, who fled Creedmoor Psychiatric Center, where he was committed for the 1971 murders of his wife and son. It's not known if Judy was fully aware of why Richard was at Creedmoor, Judy did make a brief phone call to her sister shortly after she left and said she was okay, but did not share any additional information. Now, anyone that has information on this case is asked to contact the New York Police Department at 212-694-7781. But there is so much more to this case, guys, and we are going to, to dive into it. Because it's been nearly 50 years since Judy disappeared with an alleged killer once eyed in the Son of Sam murders. A cold case could possibly be heating up thanks to podcasters, especially the Vanished podcast. Uh, the mysterious case of Judy was recently resurrected by the Vanished podcast, drawing new attention to her case. It's a little-known story, and as I said, this teenager vanished in 1977 with her murderous fiancé, Richard Rosenberg, while battling mental health issues, which in and of itself is a battle. Uh, it's a strange set of circumstances, because when someone disappears with a guy who was institutionalized, It, it, it raises some alarm bells, to say the very least. Now, according to Marissa Jones, who hosts the Vanished podcast, it appears that Judith and Richard probably intentionally disappeared together, but perhaps, at some point, Judy's disappearance was no longer intentional. And so let's dive into this. Now, there was a tip that was called in to the show about a possible sighting in Olympia, Washington, but it turned out to be Judy's sister, Laura. So that tip basically led nowhere. And in the 47 years since her disappearance, Judy's family has struggled to find clues, claiming they have received very little help from the NYPD or the media. But that was until Marissa and the Vanish podcast stepped in. According to family, the support from podcasters has been invaluable because there never was a real investigation into her disappearance before that. No one has tried to help this family. Judy was a Bronx native and one of eight children. She graduated from Evander Child's, Holy, Evander Child's High School in 1975, and that summer she moved in with extended family in Flushing, uh, after choosing to stay in New York City when her parents and five younger siblings moved to an inherited farm in Kansas. However, her behavior raised alarm bells among her family members. Her cousin feared that she was suffering from obsessive compulsive and eating disorders and may have been involved in some type of drug use. In August of 1976, she was a student at LaGuardia Community College in Long Island City, and she wrote to her family in Kansas that she was taking classes that might help her better understand her mental health issues. One day, a faculty member contacted the family, informing them that Judy had been hiding under a desk and refused to come out. So, the family drove with an unidentified staff member to Elmhurst General Hospital 
um, to see if there was anything that they could really do to try to help. Unfortunately, she was never admitted to the hospital due to a doctor's strike. And the, the family was actually advised to go somewhere else, which is insane to me. Uh, the next option was the Creedmoor Psychiatric Center in Queens Village, where Judy, despite a warning from her family, had herself admitted... And, you know, it's just a sad situation, guys. This is where Judy is believed to have met Reisenberg, who was a notorious Creedmoor patient. Eleven years Judy Sr. And he was given free roam at this institution, despite killing his wife and son during an approximately two-night stay. Now, the family believed that Judy didn't belong at this facility. And as soon as they could, you know, they, they got her out. But Brown and Reisenberg carried on their relationship while he was institutionalized, even visiting Judy's aunt's house in Flushing on at least one occasion. Reisenberg was a wannabe Casanova, according to many. He was a wo womanizing son of a bitch, in my opinion. Um, and, but he worked at the Kennedy Airport until January of 1971. That is when he brutally butchered his wife with a knife and strangled their 17-month-old son with an extension cord that he tried to dispose of at work. Now, initially, he tried to throw investigators off by... Scrolling, scrolling a message of death to all Jew lovers with soap on the bathroom window, I mean bathroom mirror, but it wasn't long before the NYPD closed in on Reisenberg, who had made two suicide attempts in his youth, including one where a note had been written in soap on a bathroom mirror. The grisly slangs coincided with the end of an affair that Reisenberg was having with someone at work. In March of 1973, Reisenberg was found not guilty due to insanity in a non-jury trial in Queen's Supreme Court and was remanded to a mental hospital. Because he wasn't found liable for the killings, Reisenberg received two-thirds of his late wife's life insurance, which was about $78,000 in today's money. Now, you tell me how that works. You kill your wife and kid... And you're still able to collect the life insurance because of the fact that you got off on an insanity plea? In January of 2023, Judy's cousin contacted Reisenberg's sister, Linda, who died earlier in the year, uh, or earlier this year. Uh, she claimed that a Creedmoor doctor exploited her parents for cash in exchange for favorable reports on his mental side. The arrangement gave Reisenberg unescorted grounds and privileges, allowing him to come and go from Creedmoor using the funds from his murdered wife's life insurance to eat at the Hillside Diner, attend Mets games, and tailor his clothing, inspects, and preppy attire. This is insane, guys. How is this guy? This reminds me so much of Gypsy Rose Blanchard, just to be honest. This guy kills his wife, is able to collect two-thirds of the life insurance. Then he cons the staff at this institution to where he's got free reign to come and go at his own discretion. He's going to Met games. He's buying all the latest clothes and fashion. Uh, I mean, it, it's absolutely insane. And then he's going out and he's having these steak dinners at the Hillside Diner. What in the world? And he may have also gained access to secure areas of Creedmoor by illegally purchasing a skeleton key from one of the staff members. His sister said he even had a girlfriend while he was institutionalized, according to a report at the time. Among Reisenberg's multiple alleged Creedmoor gal pals was Gloria Morena, the wife of Hollywood actor Burt Young, who was later nominated for an Oscar for his breakout role in Rocky opposite Sylvester Stallone. 
Marina was remanded to Creedmoor in July of 1972 after she fatally stabbed her husband's son, Richard. Multiple sources say that Risenberg and Marina were inseparable and may have had a romantic relationship while both were patients at Creedmoor. Now, Marrera allegedly died by suicide in 1974, two years before Judy's disappearance. Risenberg also spent a lot of time with Alan LaHoff, 75, of Providence, New York, a former attendant at Creedmoor. Um, Potero met LaHoff while both were mining for information about the conjoined cases of Brown and Risenberg on WebSleuths, the internet forum for sharing and discussing true crime information. A retired judge in New State, eh, La Hoff, a retired judge in upstate New York, said that the NYPD once considered Risenberg a suspect in the Son of Sam murders, but that notion was ultimately dismissed. However, in early 1977, authorities would recommend Risenberg be transferred to a more secure facility instead. Uh, of where he was being held at, and instead of being transferred, Risenberg fled. He wanted out because you don't want to be imprisoned in a state mental hospital. And he's never been caught. Uh, according to all accounts, this man is incredibly bright, although he doesn't sound too bright if he used the same method to leave a note on the mirror of the bathroom uh, when he killed his wife and son, as he had previously done in his suicide attempts when he was younger. But that's just my opinion. Um, you know, Judy announced her intentions to marry Risenberg in a letter addressed to her mom and dad and the family in January of 1977. And then she was n never seen again. Um, you know, she had a good heart. She was tough. She was shy. And she may have really thought that she was in love with the serial killer. But it would be very tragic how this all played out. Judy's last known contact with her family was in the summer of 1977 when she briefly called her oldest sister, Kathy Brown. Uh, Judy called Kathy, called Kathy and said something along the lines of, I'm okay, don't worry about me. Um... But it wasn't a long, a long phone call, and Judy was quick to hang up. Um, Judy remains missing in the eyes of the NYPD, which has entered her DNA into CODIS, uh, which is the Combined DNA Index System. In the event of a DNA match, the NYPD should be notified. Um, now... According to the NYPD, Judy is not considered kidnapped, and it is unknown if she's living or deceased. Uh, the spokesperson with the NYPD said that if the NYPD is provided with any credible leads concerning Judy's disappearance, they will investigate. Today, new information has been uncovered by various sources that uh, Risenberg had been living in Colorado during the mid-90s, perhaps while raising a family. Now, he is considered a fugitive of justice after fleeing Creedmoor. Risenberg contacted a lawyer and sought to turn himself in around June of 1994. But a source close to Risenberg said he was discouraged from following through, thinking that he would get very little sympathy from the courts in light of O.J. Simpson, who was at the time headed to trial for the murder of his wife. Now, it's been learned that Risenberg was believed to have been alive around 2000 and in contact with a sympathetic family member who was financially savvy. It is possible that Risenberg, who would turn 78 years old this year, and Brown, who would be 66, are still alive today. A source said Risenberg's sister answered a resounding yes when once asked if it were possible that her brother and Brown had a child together. An investigator for the Legal Aid Society said he's going to continue to fight for closure in Judy's case. Judy deserves to be searched for. And 
the ultimate goal is to be able to say that they've done their best to find out what happened to this missing woman cowering underneath a desk who mattered to her entire family. And that's basically what we know in the disturbing disappearance of Judy Brown. It's a sad case. Uh, I mean, I do believe that she's likely out there with this, this Richard Reisenberg, who we know is has murdered at least his wife and daughter, if nothing else, and may be connected to other murders. It's disturbing. The family needs closure. And they have never given up on finding out what happened to Judy. Um, again, if anyone has information on this case, I encourage you to reach out to the NYPD at 212-694-7781 with any information that you may have. I mean, this case dates back to 1977, guys. That's, I was one year old when Judy disappeared. I am 49 years old today. So, think about going 48 years without any answers as to what has happened to your missing loved one. And it's very well possible that Judy may be alive out there somewhere. Uh, so, you know, I'm hoping that in the coming months, there will be some people working on getting a better age-progressed photograph of Judy out there and circulating on social media. Uh, I am encouraged that she is in NamUs and that the DNA is on file. That way, if she is found, they can they can compare the DNA and make a positive identification. But that's the case of Judy Brown, who is missing out of Queens, New York. I really want to thank everyone for tuning in today. Uh, again, a very disturbing case. A case where family has been waiting way too long for any real answers. Do me a favor, guys. I need you to smash that like button. Let's get Judy's face and her story out into the YouTube algorithm. Also, if you're not subscribed to the channel yet, consider clicking that subscribe button. It really helps the channel out. And if you ring that notification bell, you'll always be alerted whenever I post another missing persons video. But most important of all, I need you to click that share button. Share this to your Facebook, your Twitter, your Instagram, wherever you have social media. It only takes a moment of your time to do, and it can make all the difference in the world in whether we're able to find Judy and bring answers for this family or not. As always, guys, I do want to thank you so much for tuning in and watching. I appreciate each and every single one of you. I also want to give a shout out to The Vanished Podcast and Marissa for helping the family to get Judy's face out there all over the airwaves. The more people that hear this, the better the chances are that we can bring closure, guys. As always, I do want to thank you so much for tuning in. Y'all be kind to one another out there, and I'll see you soon in the next video, guys.